Hello, History 17B, Spring Quarter 2024, and welcome to Lecture 4. You are looking at a pair of soldiers from the American Civil War. I chose this image partly because these men are so painfully young and partly because of the weapons that they have on them. Aside from cannons, the Civil War was fought mainly between people who could see one another. The range of a rifle is minimal compared to war weapons that will show up later in this course, particularly if you are using the bayonet on the end of it. You may also notice that they have pretty much zilch in the way of protective gear. I'm not going to give you any battlefield with dead body images. I think American Yacht might have some in it. But it's good to remember that once a war ends, the soldiers who survive are demobilized and have to try to fit back into a social system that really doesn't have much use for the skills they have been developing for the most part. This class starts in 1865, marking the end of the American Civil War. But of course, the events following the Civil War built on issues already present in the lead up to the war. And although the result of the war was to maintain the U.S. as a single country, and although slavery came to an end in law and name, if not so much in practice, many of the big issues from before the Civil War would continue to be big issues after the Civil War, meaning that they are of concern to us in this class. In order to understand the context of the U.S. from the beginning of this class onwards, we need to have a basic idea of American government structure, as well as the way that the U.S. was expanding geographically in the 19th century. I found that not all intro history students are familiar with the structure of American government, and even those who are don't necessarily delve into its relationship to the American Civil War. So we will start there. This is going to be a really superficial overview, so go to YAW, your textbook, if you want more detail. The Library of Congress and the National Archives also have useful websites. I find that it's not unusual for people to think that the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. government came into being right after the American Revolution. In fact, in the aftermath of the revolution, the former 13 British colonies became states joined in a confederation. In this case, a confederation is a union of autonomous sovereign states. A federation is a union of states linked by a central government, but maintaining some degree of independence in internal affairs. And this might not seem like a very big deal, but it is the federal government that is going to grow with the country as we go through this course. The original 13 colonies, now states, were initially united by Articles of Confederation. To make an incredibly long and complex story short, this didn't work particularly well as it was difficult to have any sort of consistency on things like money and a military. So, after a great deal of acrimony or ill will and argument, in 1789, the Constitution of the U.S. was ratified. One major concern of the drafters of the Constitution was that the power of government should not be all in the hands of one person or one small group of people who shared interests with one another, but not necessarily anyone else. At least, not anyone else who was an adult white male who owned property, which was the governing group. So the ratified Constitution embodies what we call the separation of powers, in which the government was divided and still is, although with a certain amount of adjustment, since the world didn't stay in the late 18th century, the government was divided into three branches. I've put little blurbs for each here, including a short explanation of why they are named as they are that might help you remember. So the legislative branch writes laws. Lex legis is Latin for law. Think Congress. The executive branch makes certain that the laws of the country are faithfully executed, that's the quote, or carried out. Think president and presidential advisors. 
the judicial branch judges whether laws are broken as well as whether laws written by Congress are in keeping with the constraints of the U.S. Constitution. Think courts, including the United States Supreme Court. And we will be talking about court decisions later on in the next modules. Of these right now, however, it is the legislative branch that we care about. When I put rights laws, it sounds a bit trivial, don't shoplift. But think that these laws will govern all the workings of the country, like taxes, the economy, international trade, and so on. The size of the legislative branch is determined by the number of states in the union and by the population of each state. So the number of senators is constant now because the number of states is fairly constant at 50, but that's not the case when this class starts. Every state gets two senators, whether the state is large or small, but the number of representatives for each state is determined related to the population of that state. You are looking in the map here at the totality of the United States in 1790. All of the states had and have two senators each, regardless of size. Rhode Island, little bitty Rhode Island here, had two senators. Virginia, relatively massive Virginia, had two senators and still has. But when it came to representatives, the number was calculated based on population. So in 1790, Rhode Island had a population of about 68,000, and they had two representatives. Virginia had a population of around 630,000, not quite 10 times as much, and they had 18 representatives. At the time, senators were chosen by state governments. This would change to direct election later in our class. Representatives were elected by the people, but at the time, voting people had to own property. So mainly white men, wealthy enough to own some form of property. Although there were, especially in New Jersey, there were some women who owned property. And throughout this region here, there were pre black people who owned property and at the time were able to vote. However, for the most part, and very much for the most part, those voting were white people, white men of the upper classes. But population was calculated counting every adult. Both the northern states and the southern states were about 50-ish percent women. So leaving them out was fairly even in terms of proportion of representatives. But the southern states had far more enslaved people who were figured into the population, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the calculation here, factored into the population, but who could not vote. Moreover, land in the southern states tended to be held by a small subset of white men. Poor white men did not always own property, and so they could not vote. We could think about how representative the opinions of an elite subset of this population might have been. Spoiler, not particularly representative of the actual people on the ground. The other parts of the U.S. that we see here are the blue bits. The green bits are states. The orange bits are contested with Britain and with Spain. The blue bits were territories nominally held by the U.S., but not fully formed states, meaning they're not represented in the federal government. But the intent was to turn these into states, each of which, each state that gets carved out of these, would have two senators and some number of representatives. The economy of the northern states was largely based on industry and wage labor. That of the southern states was more agrarian or farm-based, and a substantial part of the labor force was enslaved. So both regions had an interest in what the new states would look like. 
more industrial and with wage labor, and their congressmen, meaning both senators and representatives, would tend to have similar policy interests to the northern states. More agrarian new states, especially if they relied on enslaved people for labor, would tend to have economic and social conditions more in line with the southern states and would increase the power of those interests with their congressmen. So it was a big deal how many states these territories were carved into and what their economy and society would look like. The United States did not stop colonizing North America with the Northwest Territory, that blue region that we just saw that was very close to New England and the Northeast and that surrounded the Great Lakes. I found that many people envision American colonization moving smoothly from East to West, highly influenced by the Manifest Destiny mythology. So we're going to skip forward in time from the New Republic, but not quite all the way to the American Civil War. From this point on, this lecture has a lot of maps, so you are forewarned. The United States in this map of 1852 is only the green parts. The other bits, the white bits, the beige bits, they're not United States. The white areas were not empty. They were occupied by people doing their own things, but by now things that were deeply impacted by American colonization. I am calling it colonization and not settlement for precisely that reason. This was not empty land to be settled. There were people here whom the United States would colonize. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had given the United States what are now California and Texas at the end of the war with Mexico. On paper, the U.S. had been given regions in the southwest of the continent. But again, these were not Mexico's to give. There were people living there who did not want to be part of either Mexico or the United States. The pink, by the way, is colonized and claimed by Great Britain, including down here, 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 and here. If we zoom in on the western half of North America, we can see that the western coast and parts of New Mexico had already been colonized. So really, U.S. colonization was not a steady westward line, but fingers reaching into and out of other regions as well. California and Oregon Territory, which includes more than what is now the state of Oregon, could be reached by sea, which, while time-consuming and not so much fun, was a breeze compared to trying to cross over land. So areas like the San Francisco Bay and the Willamette Valley in the Northwest already had substantial American settlement. The green in Utah Territory is settlement by more they were actually trying to leave the boundaries of the United States. But by the time they set up here, since they were crossing over land, the region had been ceded to the U.S. on paper. So the U.S. claimed the Mormon regions. That's why it says semi-independent on the map. I also want to point out the strip marked unorganized territory. If you read the text in the box, the U.S. had negotiated safe passage through land that was home to Native Americans, although by this time there had been some reshuffling because of displacement of Native Americans from both the West and the East. The U.S. claimed the safe passage land as their possession. We are looking here at around 23 years before the start of the American Civil War. This is the United States in 1861. The American Civil War started in April of that year. The dark green states, just all dark green, are ones that have officially seceded or claim to leave the United States. The diagonal lines indicate states that were not phasing out slavery at that point. This is why I've given you the Henniford reading on slavery in Delaware. There was not a hard line between the South and the North in terms of having the enslavement of other people seem like a reasonable thing to white Americans. 
There was an extremely messy middle that shared enslavement with the South, but, and this is a big but, their economy and culture were not centered around enslavement. If we zoom in a bit now, we can also see that the U.S. was not just claiming more of the continent on paper, but was effectively colonizing it. The old Pacific Northwest Territory and the leading edge of American colonization have indeed been carved up into states that are now part of the U.S., complete with congressmen. In the South, you can see that Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana have become part of the United States, but they entered as so-called slave states and then they seceded. They also now have their own congressmen, although they lose that when they secede. The United States government and most white Americans meant for the new territories like Nebraska territory here to become states. And just like in 1789, white folks in the North wanted the new states to share their political, social, and economic interests, and the South wanted the same thing. Every new state will change the power balance in Congress. So making a territory into a state like Kansas here was a big deal, not just a win for the U.S. as a large cohesive unit. In your pop culture package, I've given you videos that cover the political machinations prior to the Civil War. I've also given you a couple of videos that make clear the reality that not all of the folks moving into the green areas were white. The four videos I've mentioned are short ones, so I'm hoping that you will watch those, partly with your final project in mind and partly to fill in a bit of what I have just run through at light speed in the last few slides. This is 1862. The line between the Confederate states centered on enslavement and the rest of the U.S. is now a hard border. The right-hand boxes give you information on Civil War battles, and I will leave those to you. The point I want to make here is that the American Civil War was not in, it was not happening in, an isolated bubble. The federal government, the U.S. federal government, was still trying to support colonization in the West, which meant sending parts of the U.S. Army to that region to kill and displace Native Americans. The text box in the top left relates to the Dakota War, but this was only one fight among many. The pink area, again, you can see it's grown here and maybe less obvious, but it's grown a little bit here, was officially part of Great Britain. There was a bit of local conflict at the U.S.-British borders, especially in the Northwest. But the really critical bit is that Britain was a major trade partner to the U.S., so trade with Britain was essential to the U.S. economy. Britain, like the northern states of the U.S., was becoming heavily industrial in regions, and everyone, regardless of which part of the country they were from, or which country at this point, I suppose, was anxious to keep up trade with Britain. If you look down here, you can see that there is a little spot on the Gulf of Mexico that is controlled by the United States government, not the Confederate States government. If we zoom in on it, you might recognize that this is New Orleans and the Mississippi Delta. So although it's technically in the South, trade up and down the Mississippi River was largely controlled by Union forces. As long as we're down here, I'll point out the bits in pink here controlled by Britain. Belize then called British Honduras, as well as Jamaica, a major sugar producer, and some islands around. Great Britain was not just sitting on the other side of the Atlantic saying, hey, let us know when y'all are done with that fighting thing. Controlling ports and supplies coming into North America from Britain was a big deal, except in one respect. Great Britain had been critical to the U.S. South because a good bit of British industry was textile mills and the South, now the Confederacy, grew cotton. Before the American Civil War, the South had 
banked on the British economy needing Confederate cotton. But as it happened, Britain was busy colonizing India and Egypt and forcing people there to grow lots of cotton and didn't need American cotton anymore. One last thing, you'll notice that the French have claimed part of Mexico. The South, the American South, now the Confederate States, had also hoped that France might support them. After all, France had supported the confederated British North American colonies in the American Revolution, so why not the Confederacy of Southern States now? Well, it turned out that France had lots of good reasons of their own for not getting involved in the American Civil War, so French assistance never materialized for the Confederacy. This is 1863. Britain and France are still trying to hold on to parts of Central and South America. The U.S. government has even greater control over the Mississippi River here. You can transport more than supplies by boat. You can move soldiers relatively quickly, and you can put big guns and cannons on ships and shoot anyone on land. So control of the Mississippi River was a big deal. But also, you could see that the federal government was busy using part of their army to create the Idaho territory over here, the Arizona territory here, Colorado territory. One more thing, in early 1863 here, in the right text box, you can see that Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Many people now think that this was when enslaved people were legally freed. But if you read closely, you'll see that only enslaved people in the Confederate states were freed. Those in the border states that did not secede remained enslaved. This is later in 1863. The Union has split the Confederacy along the Mississippi River, but was also still busy killing Native Americans in the western half of the continent. You can see the Navajo here, but it was not as if U.S. forces only went to one place or dealt with one group of Native American people at a time. They were active all along the green-white borders here. Before we leave 1863, we are going to zoom in on New York City here. As the American Civil War dragged on, the federal government instituted a draft, meaning that men could be and were conscripted into the army to fight whether they wanted to be or not. Now, there were two exceptions to this. Wealthy white men could pay $300 at the time to have someone else go fight in their place. The other exception to the draft was black men. Many of them joined and fought for the U.S. Army, but they were not subject to the draft. This was not from any kindness or sympathy, but just because it seemed obvious to white men in government that even free black men were somehow not really Americans. This is a problem that still doesn't seem to have gone away. But back to New York in 1863. Poor white men, and I haven't even set you up with Irish immigration to the Northeast, although that will matter to us later. Anyway, poor white men, including immigrant white men who've become American, many, although by no means all, nor alone, rioted against the draft. Rich white folks were pretty well protected but black people were not. Rampaging white people destroyed entire black neighborhoods. 120 people were killed outright by the rioters, and in the wake of the riots, what had been black neighborhoods were rebuilt as white ones. This pattern of white folks rampaging in northern cities and displacing black people is one that we will see again more than once in this course after the Civil War. This is 1864, and you can see that the Confederacy was losing ground in the southern United States. Napoleon III of France was gaining ground in Mexico. 
Meanwhile, north of Mexico and west of the American Civil War, federal troops were still busy massacring Indians, although it was definitely war and not a rout. Native Americans fought and negotiated. They didn't hold for as long as they possibly could. These were their homes, hence the strategy of wholesale massacre by the federal U.S. Army. And Nevada here became a state, complete with full representation in Congress. Here we are, finally the year after the American Civil War. The Confederate forces were defeated, but that did not mean that states just re-emerged as they had been before, not immediately anyway. They had, after all, to all intents and purposes, committed treason. The legal practice of slavery was ended, and Black Americans were officially made U.S. citizens but the entire dominant culture of the South, the dominant culture of the South, had been based on the subjugation of a massive group of people. And white Southerners were not going to let that go just because they'd lost some big old war. The U.S. federal government still had troops in the South at this point to try to control developments and, for a hot minute, to try to protect the rights of Black citizens. In the West, areas controlled by the United States are sort of growing inward from all directions. Napoleon III continued to make life miserable in Mexico, although he did start thinking about withdrawing troops. You can also see the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in April of 1865. Lincoln was succeeded by his vice president. President Andrew Johnson. Johnson hailed from a border state, Tennessee, and was not entirely unsympathetic to the white South, nor was he at all friendly to the black South. This would have massive consequences for many different people in the South and in the West. And here we are in the second half of 1866. France was leaving Mexico. The former Confederate states were readmitted gradually into the Union from 1866 to 1870. The Americans and British colonists in what would become Canada had some squabbles at the border, and the United States was continuing to expand from multiple directions through this inland section of Western North America. If you have stayed with me here, or if you've been going to live lecture discussion, you probably have a fair idea of where this third part of lecture is going. The Civil War might be over, but the northeastern and southeastern parts of the country still had very different economies and cultures. One last zoom here. At this point, Native American groups were holding on in places, but those places were being increasingly squeezed. If you look closely, in late 1866, the U.S. was trying to solidify its hold on Washington Territory, Oregon as a state, Idaho Territory, Utah Territory, Arizona Territory, New Mexico Territory, Colorado Territory, Montana Territory, Dakota Territory, and Nebraska Territory. The plan when naming these geographic areas as territories was that they would become states. But despite the legal end of slavery, it still mattered a great deal who these areas might share more interest with, affecting the balance of power in Congress. Sometimes people now joke about dividing California into two states, but Congress as a whole is unlikely to support that. It would mean that this geographic region would have four senators rather than two. The U.S. has changed immensely between 1866 and now, but the divisions that formed early affected who was in the U.S. government from where, and they still impact American politics. Key points for Lecture 4. The U.S. government is divided into three sections. The executive, think president, the judicial, think Supreme Court, and the legislative, think Congress. 
the legislative branch writes laws that affect all aspects of the country, economy, permitted, prescribed activities, and so on, but the interests of each state are represented separately in Congress. Each state gets two people in the Senate. The number of members of the House of Representatives from any state is related to the population of that state. From the creation of the U.S. Constitution and thus basic government structure for the U.S., states in the Northeast of North America differed from states in the Southeast in many aspects of economy and culture, meaning that members of Congress from the two regions often had different goals and desires when it came to writing and accepting laws. As the United States colonized more and more of North America, the government planned to create new states in the new regions, but each new state would have two senators and some number of representatives. These new congressmen, and they were all men at the time, could shift the balance of power in government when it came to approving or rejecting laws that would affect all of the states. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in the aftermath of the American Civil War ended legal slavery, and the states that had seceded to the Confederacy were gradually readmitted into the United States complete with congressional representation. The cultures and economies of the northeastern and southeastern states often remained at odds, so both regions had a vested interest in the formation of new states in the western half of North America whose members of Congress could tip the balance of power on any issue. Since I used maps to such a great extent in this lecture, I thought that I would make the coda, and remember you're not responsible for the coda, a broader rumination on the power of maps. To begin with, what purposes, plural, do maps serve? And know that these are not mutually exclusive. The obvious one to us is directions, finding where you're going. But Maps can also explain relationships beyond spatial. They can project power, they can mock power, they can signal wealth, they can signal patriotism, they can convey a sense of progress or a sense of inevitability, they can share knowledge, they can provide decoration, they can help make sense of relationships of one thing to another, they can reinforce faith, they can convey a sense of wonder, they demonstrate technical know-how, they suggest mastery over nature, and we can use them when we're studying history. Of course, what you are looking at here is an armillary sphere. It's Italian from the 17th century. That's the 1600s. It's made of brass gilded with gold, walnut wood, beech wood. An armillary sphere is an early astronomical device for representing the great circles of the heavens, so movements of the constellations, including in the most elaborate instruments, the horizon, meridian, equator, tropics, polar circle, and an ecliptic hoop. The sphere is a skeleton celestial globe with circles divided into degrees for angular measurement. This is a perpetual wheel also from Italy. It was made after 1582, but before 1613. And I'll explain how we know that in just a moment. It is made on paper by Antonio Santucci. The perpetual wheel is dedicated, this particular one, is dedicated to Christine of Lorraine, wife of Ferdinand I de Medici. People in the know can tell this from the Medici Lorraine coat of arms. There's no precise date, but as the, as the dedication indicates, the engraving was made after the calendar reform promulgated by Pope Gregory XIII in 1582. The engraving comprises five concentric wheels for finding sunrise, the phases of the moon, mobile feasts, the dominical letter, the golden number, and the epact at any given time of the year. And you might notice if we blow up the central part, there is an armillary sphere depicted at the center. This is a sign of technical know-how and of the wealth of the Medici family. And you can see up here, there are two male figures with compasses and they're measuring stellar and physical distances on a celestial and a terrestrial globe. 
this is a pair of shoes by Manolo Blahnik. And no one has correct my pronunciation on that. So if you are a designer aficionado and I'm mispronouncing it, please do let me know. They have on them a map of New York City. Now, chances are not good that you would be able to find yourself in New York City by using these as a map. So what purpose does the map serve? You might think about New York City as a locus of money, of fashion, and of social power. This particular pair of shoes was marked down when I found it from over $4,000 to a mere $3,403.87 plus 15% off shipping. I don't know why, but I find it very funny that someone who will shell out three to $4,000 for a pair of shoes would worry about having a chunk of change taken off of the shipping. But what do I know? This is a type of map called a Mapamundi, and this one is located in Hereford Cathedral in England, and Mapamundi were English specialties in the Middle Ages. This one's drawn in great detail. It could, the words on it, such as there are, could only be read by people who spoke Norman French, which was the language of the literate secular elite. But the Mapamundi interpreted the world in spiritual as well as geographical terms. It included biblical illustrations and portrayals of classical learning and legend. So it includes pictorial descriptions of the outside world. It was used for teaching natural history, classical legends, and for reinforcing religious beliefs. This particular map is drawn on a single sheet of vellum, which is processed calfskin, East in a map of Mundi is always at the top of the map. South is on the right, west is at the bottom, and north is on the left. At the center of the map of Mundi is Jerusalem, the center of the Christian world. The continents are illustrated with drawings of cities and towns in classical mythology. There's a, a minotaur on there somewhere. The top of the map shows Christ sitting at the Day of Judgment flanked by angels. And this map here is obviously a modern rendering of a map of Mundi so that you can see, although there are real geographic places represented, their re relationship has to do with ideas of the spiritual world in medieval England and not only with their geographic placement. This is a celestial globe with clockwork, which no longer works, but at the time would move things around. It was made in Vienna, Austria in 1579. When it rotated, it would chart the constellations. This object unites extraordinarily complex mechanical technology, even for now, with great aesthetic beauty. It belonged to the Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf II, who displayed it in his curiosity cabinet. It was valued both for its function as a scientific apparatus and for its rich, elegant casework. The horse down here has wings, it's Pegasus, and it bears the globe on its outstretched wings. Astronomy was enabled by knowledge of arithmetic and geometry, then considered the wings of the human mind. This is an image from Mercator's Atlas, which was made in 1613. Gerhardus Mercator was an engraver, craftsman, mathematician, and cartographer. His best known work is the volume of maps that this comes from, and it is the first volume of maps to have borne the name Atlas after the titan of ancient Greek myth, who was said to hold the world on his shoulders. I suppose when Pegasus wasn't holding it up. In 1569, Mercator devised a rectangular map with straight lines of latitude going this way and longitudes going this way, crossing at right angles. And it was intended to be a new way of representing a round globe on a flat sheet of paper. This Mercator projection swiftly became the standard map projection. It's used and was used for nautical purposes because of its ability to represent sailing routes of constant course as straight lines. You'll still see Mercator projection on maps published now. Although it uses a linear scale, which is equal in all directions, it does exaggerate the size of land masses near the poles.
This, I will not torment you with my bad Spanish, but this is a map of California made by Nicholas de Fer in 1646 to 1720, somewhere in that region of time. It's made of ink and hand colored, and it shows parts of Mexico and parts of California as an island. And I've enlarged San Diego over here. I think it's the same San Diego as now, but it may certainly not be. I have it here partly as an illustration of the way that names, and in this case, religious names, are used as part of the colonization process. Because the people who lived here when the map was made didn't call the region San Diego. This is a similar map. This is the Great Lakes region, and since that region was settled by France, this is a map made by the French. I won't read in my terrible French, but I will tell you that it says more or less to Monseigneur Le Marquis de Senelay and of Lanre Baron de Sioux, advisor to the king in all councils, secretary of state, that would be of France, and of his majesty's commandments, the French majesty, commander and grand treasurer of his orders, by his very humble and very obedient and very obligated servant, E. Baptiste Louis Franklin, master of hydrography for the king in Quebec. This is a map of New England. Same idea. The people who were colonizing got to name the regions, whether the people living in the regions accepted those names or not. The cartographer here was Dutch because the Dutch settled this region as well as the English, the Dutch more towards New York, the English more towards New England. This chart shows the fishing banks in the Gulf of Maine and details the coast between Cape Cod and Cape Sable. Until the 18th century, voyagers from Europe found their way to North America by what was called dead reckoning, and I'll explain that in just a moment, using the compass that could point north, the chip log, and the lead line. Latitude measurement was available, but there was not yet a reliable way to determine longitude when you were on the ground or on the water, as the case may be. Charts were poor, and there were limited sailing directions for Maine. Dead reckoning in navigation is the process of calculating your current position of some moving object, which would be you on the water, by using a previously determined position or fix, and then incorporating estimates of speed, heading direction, and course over elapsed time, which means if you get any of this wrong, you may not be at all where you think you are, which is precisely what happened to Spanish explorers. This is properly called the Map of Several Nations of Indians to the Northwest of South Carolina. It's commonly known as the Catawba Deerskin Map because it was drawn on deerskin. You can see where the little head used to be and the legs and the tail would have been back here. This was presented to Francis Nicholson, the colonial governor of South Carolina, around 1721. The map is a stylistic representation of the Indian nations between Charlestown, now Charleston, South Carolina, and the colony of Virginia. The map is oriented so that southerly features are on the left side, while northerly features are on the right by the head of the deer. European settlements are depicted in squares and straight lines, while Indian nations appear in circles. The Nassau is shown as the most central community of the Catawba Nation, appearing in the center of the map in the largest circle. Rather than emphasizing geographic accuracy and scale, the map focuses on the network of relationships between Indian nations and between the English. This served purposes of diplomacy rather than what we would think of as cartography now and was meant to communicate trade relationships. This is a fan from the late 18th century, the 1700s, and it is engraved with hand-colored maps of Central America. On the reverse is a discourse urging France to make 
a canal connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans by way of Lake Nicaragua. This is a map of the Red River Valley in Louisiana from Spanish camp where the exploring party of the U.S. was met by Spanish troops to where the Red River enters the Mississippi. This was made in 1806 when the U.S. was expanding into the Louisiana Purchase. Since our class will be starting right after the Civil War in the next lecture, here is a map of United States military railroads showing the railroads operated during the war from 1862 to 1866, so into Reconstruction, as military lines. This map of the southeast shows towns, ports, rivers, and state boundaries. Railroad gauges are printed in color. The railroads were used for moving troops and supplies. This map says what it is. A plan of the Battle of Cold Harbor, June 3, 1864, in the American Civil War. After two days' preparation, the main federal assault took place in the early morning of June 3 against a well-entrenched Confederate army. The map depicts the area of Hanover County, Virginia, that includes Old and New Cold Harbor, Gaines Mill, and Bethesda Church in relation to the Chickahominy and Totopotomy <laughs> rivers. So you can see that small things like mills and people's homes, these are part of the military map. If we zoom in on the key, we could see that color coding indicates the location of Union and Confederate forces. Confederate forces are called rebels here because the map was made by Union forces. We could tell the positions of artillery, cavalry, and regular troops. We can also see the symbol for houses, reminding us what the region was before it became a battlefield. Federal losses in that battle were overwhelming, and by noon, General Grant called a halt to the entire attack. This is a close view of the text written under the map. So if we go back to the map, you can see that there's text written underneath after the battle had been fought. It says, Union loss 13,153, of whom 1,705 were killed, 9,042 wounded, and 2,406 missing. Probably they would end up being dead as well, but not certainly. 10,000 were laid out in 20 minutes and they put exclamation points. Rebel loss, 1,500 only. This is a German bombing target map of London's docks. It's called Sea Serpent, and I will not torture you with my German. This map dates to the Blitz and shows regions that have been destroyed already by the Germans in green. The London Blitz began during the Battle of Britain, September 1940, and it continued into 1941. London's docks and the East End suffered badly. The codename Sea Serpent probably had to do with the kind of sinuous shape of the Thames River here. This is the London Tube map. It is not scaled to represent constant distances. You will find connections if you're taking a train from Covent Garden. You know where you could connect from Hobart to get to different places. But if you try to walk above ground using this map, it can be somewhat tricky. I know, I've tried it. This is the actual course that the tube tracks take under London. This is King's Cross Station. It seems more complicated than it actually is on the ground. On the other hand, this is the first floor of the Social Sciences and Humanities Building here at UC Davis, lovingly known as the Death Star. And it seems less complicated in the map than it really is because doors are randomly locked throughout here. So you can't actually walk where you think that you can. This is a UC Davis map, clearly, and it is showing gender inclusive references streams. And I think the feeling was when they made the map, look, we have so many of them. But I can tell you, it doesn't seem like a lot if you're looking for one. This is a satellite map 
of UC Davis. It's the Arboretum that's marked. We've become pretty familiar with satellite maps, but you might think of them as a projection of power and also as something that is aesthetically pleasing, not unlike the armillary sphere. Our textile backdrops for this lecture, we had two. One was a washed out region in the front of the uniform and one on the back. This is a naval jacket from 1862 during the American Civil War. The initials MS on the epaulet stand for medical service. The title was replaced in 1872 with MD for medical department. The length on the epaulets distinguishes rank. So the Met informs us that in this case, the two and a half inch length indicates the rank of assistant surgeon. This style of coat was introduced by style short in the front here, tails in the back, was introduced in 1832, about three decades before the American Civil War, but retained its identical form and materials throughout the Civil War, reminding us that things like fashions change at different rates and in different ways, depending on the context.